church. Um, we're going to start today with a little more mellow, a little more um, intimate, and just get our, um, just prepare our hearts for worshiping as we come before him. So if you guys could just please um, stand and worship us this morning. So
should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Please be seated. I'd like to read to you from Ephesians or Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, 
provoking and envying each other. When we accept Jesus Christ, he gives us this, he gives us his Holy Spirit to help us to change that we couldn't before without him, to rebuild that conscience God gave us so that we know the right things to do. And it's a growth process that the Holy Spirit works on us. It's, you know, sometimes we kind of think it'd be nice if, you know, boom, God gave us all these things automatically. We're there. You know, we had the patience and kindness, goodness, all that. But it's a growth process. And a fruit, okay, when you stop and think, when God created everything, he created everything, created man and woman for a purpose. One of the purposes was to work the ground in the garden. God's provided the trees and that produce the fruit, but it takes us working with it. And the same with fruit in our lives of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works with us. We have to do our part. And part of our part is worship, of coming here, listening to his word, being encouraged by each other, worshiping, giving God recognition for he is, and, and giving because it mentions one of the things is envy and all the sinful desires and things. And so many times that involves money and materialism because scripture talks about it there's always that conflict between money worshiping money worshiping god loving god loving money there's that conflict and our giving of our tithes and offerings helps build and grow us away from that what this world teaches us what this world puts on us that you know it's all about things it's all about what we have that defines who you are and what defines us as god and who he's created us to be so as we worship, we are growing into these things that as we leave this place, we can be that example of God's love by our patience, by our kindness, by the way we treat people. So let's be praying this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you we can be here because of who you are, because of what you've done. You've done so many things throughout history and so many things in our lives to bring us to today where we can worship you and we can grow and get to know you better and become the people you designed us to be. And so work in our lives, our hearts, our minds this morning as we worship you, as we see you face to face, as we hear you speak to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. Glad to see everybody here. And those online, thanks for tuning in. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we want to invite you to stop at our Welcome Center right out there. We have a gift to say thanks uh, for being here with us today. But I'm, I'm glad you're here and that. And, you know, a, a question to start off with. Do you ever, you ever feel like life's going so fast that it's just blurry? <laughs> you almost can't focus on, on it? I mean, just, just think about this. Tomorrow's August 1st already. You know, for the summer, I was just talking this morning after first service, uh, uh, one of the youth that's going to be a senior, Matthew Miller, was here, and, and I was talking with him and, and everything, and he was like, yeah, we got talking, he's like, three weeks and school starts. 
you know, where's my summer gone type of thing. And, and, and it, life can get going so fast, we can get moving so fast, it's just like goes by, it's like in this blur, and, and, and we have a hard time focusing or remembering or, or, or paying attention to maybe what's important. And that's kind of why we, we decided to do this series or focus on this series and look at this series uh, about a brand new you. You know, and, and, and asking ourselves, do, do we kind of need to have this renewal of the Holy Spirit within our lives, I guess is the best way to put it that we've been talking about. And last week when we started off, I just asked two very simple questions, you know, do we even need it? And so how, how can I be renewed? And, you know, great questions to ask our, our, ourselves. And I said, the way to find out if we really, really need it, there's four simple questions to ask we went over last week. First and foremost, am I eager to serve? Do I find myself getting excited about serving God, about getting plugged into a ministry, finding a ministry? Am I even plugged into a ministry in any church anywhere at all, serving in any capacity, church, parachurch? Am I eager to serve God? Or, or am I enjoying my time with God? Do I look forward to the times that I get to pray with Him and get to talk with Him? And, and do I look forward to the times that I get to open His Word? and read his word, and, and study the word? Is that something I enjoy? If you answered no to those two, then it might be time in your life you look for that spiritual renewal or what you might need to. Or am I growing in my relationship with God? Am I closer today with my understanding? Am I more in love today with God than say maybe I was a couple months ago, six months, or a year ago? And am I a godly example? And I threw a really tough one out there to you. I said, think about it this way when it comes to godly example. Would you be happy to know that everybody in this room with you right now, their walk with God is just like your walk with God? Would you be happy with that? Are you a godly example? And we said that if we answered no to any one of those four questions, then there's probably a good strong you know, probability that we are in need of a Holy Spirit renewal uh, in, in our lives, which is not a bad thing. It's an okay thing. It's actually a good thing. And, and we said that it's simply, a lot of the times, it's done by just understanding who we've made that commitment to first and foremost, and maybe even sometimes in our lives, recommitting to that because, like I said, life gets busy. And we forget who we've committed to. We forget what we're called to. So recommitting ourselves back you know, to that relationship with God and surrendering to His will. And I gave an illustration about if you're on a boat and you decide, you know, you're trying to get to shore, and you take your anchor and you throw it to shore, and you start pulling on that line, do you pull the shore to you, or do you pull the boat to the shore? And of course, it's a simple answer. The boat goes to the shore. But a lot of the times what we try to do is we try, in the example of pulling the shore to us, pulling God's will into our life. God, I want you to come in and line up with my will, what I want to do, when I want to do, how I want to do it. And, but that's not how it works. We are to pull ourselves into the will of God and surrender to that. And when we do, then we can be obedient and then God can use us God can use us in ways you know as we've talked about and learned here in ways that we didn't even know we could be used within our life and today what I want us to focus on is our need to renew our vision that God has for his church which of course is us you know sometimes we forget the vision that God has for his church or understand even our roles of what that is within the church because I think a lot of the times you know when we when we first enter into that relationship however you want to say it, we get born again you accept Christ as your savior uh, whatever this when you do that you're excited there's that excitement there's that freshness like wow I can't believe this and 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 you're excited and wanting to go out and share that with others you know, because you've got something that's new, something that's exciting to you. So you want others to know, and so you get excited about it. And maybe you hear somebody, you know, uh, you're listening to something, or you hear a preacher get up and preach on evangelism, or preach on going out and reaching the community, and you're like right there. It's just getting you excited because you know that that's how God wants to use you. And you're excited that that's the way that God wants to use you, and you know He's going to use you in mighty ways. And, and, you know, you just start out that walk, that relationship with God, but then weeks and months and and years kind of go by, and, and, and all of a sudden, somehow, over that time, your walk with Christ, somehow, that vision fades. Or maybe it gets, as we were saying, that it, it gets blurred. It's not as clear to you as it was when you first accept, accepted Christ, and it becomes kind of a distant memory. I mean, yeah, you might still talk about it. You might even believe in your heart, and you know that, yeah, it's important. It is something that I should be doing that I should be understanding, that I should be living in my life. But if the truth be known, it's probably because of everything we talk about, it's probably one of the last things that's on your mind. 
in your walk, in your life. I, I sent an email out this past week uh, to, to everyone. I said this, um, think about this for a minute. Just in this past week, and you can think about this right now, you know, how much time did you spend pondering the fact that God has a vision for the church, which includes you, to be a part of that? I mean, if we're like most people, and if we get honest, you know, we probably gave it a little, maybe if any, thought at all. And so that's why today what I want to try to do is to change that by reminding us, or maybe you'll be hearing it for the first time, you didn't understand it, that we are an integral part of God's vision, of God's plan that he has for his church here in this world. And God wants us to begin thinking on a much grander scale than we've been thinking about in the past and bring us to a personal renewal that focuses on his vision for our future. So I want to start off by reminding us about three things that God says to us. First of all, he says, I'm commissioned. Anytime anybody accepts that God and gives their life to God, you know, as I said earlier, is born again, we are all, those people are all commissioned. We're accepting the challenge that God has that, that we hear about uh, in Matthew chapter 28. Remember this, starting verse 18? And Jesus came and said, to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this commission from Christ to make disciples, to baptize them, to, to teach them to obey, was given some 2,000 years ago to the disciples. And it's the exact same commission that's given to people today. Anybody who says, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower, I'm a believer in Christ. It's the exact same commission that we are all called to within our life. The accountability that we are to be the church. It doesn't matter who you are. It's for men, it's for women, it's for kids, it's for older, it's for younger, it's for singles, it's for married, it's for divorced. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've given your life to Christ, that's our commission to fulfill that God believes within us. But we're not only commissioned, he says, you're empowered. I'm empowered. And unlike the government, God doesn't demand unfanned mandates, if you'll allow me to throw that in there. And, and you know what I mean by that. Not picking on this particular government. All governments do it, no matter what the party is in there. But what I mean by that is, sometimes the federal government will create a law, or they'll create a procedure, or they'll create a rule, and they'll pass it down to the state level, and they'll say, now, this is what you have to do. And there's no funding to support it. They're just like, I don't know how you're going to do it in your state, but it doesn't matter. It's the law, so go do it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you get stuck figuring out, okay, do we raise this to whatever. You, that state's left alone to figure out how to do it on their own. And we learned, thankfully, last week that that's not how God works. Praise God that that's not what he does. He never asks us to do anything that he does and also give us the resources necessary to accomplish whatever it is he's asked us to do. And he's asked us to do something pretty big. Remember a Acts 1.8? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So again, that same commission that was given to those disciples some 2,000 years ago, they were empowered to have the resources to go out and do it. It's the same commission given to us and the same empowerment that we have here today to go out. And what that means is this. What that means for anybody that, like myself, I'll pick on myself here. What that means is, I don't have an excuse. <laughs> I can't stand up here and say before you, yeah, I know what God's asked David to do. I just don't have the resources to do it. Because that's not what Christ tells me. He says, I'm empowered. Now, there may be some things that I know how to do, that, and, and you know how to do, and the people know how to do, but they don't have the resources. I mean, I may know how to build a house. I may know what it takes to build a house, but right now I can guarantee you I do not have the resources to go buy what I need to buy to purchase what I need to purchase to build that house. I, I, I know I have the knowledge of how to, I just don't have the money resources. And there are some people that will be out there that they have the money, but they really don't know, have a clue on where to start or how to start when it comes to that. And there's some people that they've got the knowledge and they've got the money, they just don't have the resource of time to, to put into it to, to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. But see, with God, he says, you will have all the time you need. You'll have all the money you need. You'll have all the knowledge. Everything you need to accomplish what I have commissioned you to do, what I have called you to do, what I have created you to do, I will empower you. You will have the resource to do out there. 
And then he lets us know that we're entrusted. We're commissioned and we're empowered because we're entrusted with something that is so beautiful and so powerful. And I think this is sometimes what, what stops us short because we forget what we've been entrusted with by God. He's entrusted us with salvation. And what I mean by that is we don't have the power to save anybody, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Uh, you can't save me. I can't save you. You can't save your neighbor. Your, I mean, but we have the understanding of salvation. Those of us that have given our lives to Christ, those of you that have given your life to Christ, you've received that free gift of salvation, right? And so you know the blessing that comes with it. You know what's going to happen in eternity. You have that gift of salvation, and you know the promises that God says, the peace you know, the, 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 that surpasses this world, the peace that this world doesn't know. You know the hope, the strength, and everything. That's, you understand what that salvation brings, but we're not to hold that. We've been trusted, but we're not, we're not to hold that with each other for just ourselves. Excuse me. We're not to withhold that from each other. It's not just for ourselves. And, and let me see if I can, I want to illustrate this, and it might seem kind of a dramatic, very uh, dramatic illustration here, but it's a personal illustration and, and that, and, and, and it's something that I've learned definitely uh, as I thought about this and given me a whole new light in looking at, at this. Uh, um, but anyhow, most of you that know me know that a year ago this last May, my mom passed away. She passed away of small cell lung cancer. There's no cure for small cell lung cancer. I mean, people fight it and they get through it, you know, maybe two, three, maybe four, five years at the most, but there was no cure for small cell lung cancer. So my mom passed away from that. Now, where it maybe gets a little dramatic in the illustration, if somebody, say, watching online shows up at my office or one of you, I guess we could really personalize it, comes to my office tomorrow and says, hey, Dave, I just want to let you know you were talking about your mom and passing away in small cell lung cancer, and sorry to hear that, but eight years ago, I discovered the cure for small cell lung cancer, but I've just held on to it myself because, well, I mean, if I get it, I want to make sure I'm good and I'm ready and I can get cured with it, so I've just kind of held on to it myself. Now, I know my old David... And I can pretty much guarantee probably at that point, you know, I, I really don't know emotionally how I would respond to that person. I may want to send that person to go to meet Jesus face to face and have that confession with Jesus right then at that point. I don't know the anger. I don't know. But I would definitely stand there in disbelief that somebody had something so wonderful that could have blessed my life so well and kept it just to themselves. The emotions. And you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, you could place yourself there. Well, and I say all that, not, again, not to be over dramatic or whatever, but I say that illustration because what we have as Christians, this salvation that we've been entrusted with, is far greater than any cure for any disease this world has ever seen or ever will see in our life. The gift of salvation, the gift of the opportunity to spend eternity with God, that's far greater than any of that kind of stuff. And, and, and again, you know, it, it's it, like I said, you know, a lot of the times we sit there and we get, we, we hold it to ourselves and we, we forget. We become that person that's like, well, I just want to hold on. It's kind of like four weeks ago. You remember I talked about the, ush, the kid that was applying to be an usher in a movie, movie theater? And the, the owner said, what would you do if a fire broke out? Oh, you don't have to worry about me. I'd get myself out. <laughs> he forgot what he was entrusted to in that role as an usher. You know, his job wasn't just to get himself out of a burning building, but to help ush others out to the exits and everything. So you take my illustration, you take that illustration, now you apply it, you know, and you say, what would you do? What would you do if Jesus were to come back tomorrow? Oh, you don't got to worry about me. I've got the free gift of salvation. I've given my life to Jesus. But you've been entrusted as an usher. It's not just about you. I'm glad you have that. But as an usher... As a Christian, our responsibility is to make sure everybody every day we come in contact with knows the good news of the gospel. Remember 1 Thessalonians 2, 4? For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. The good news is God loves us so much he sent his only son to die for us. To be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. So he's entrusted us. You know, he's entrusted his vision to us as individuals. There's no other plan. That's how much he believes in you and that. And, and in order to do that, I need to see myself as God sees me. 
you need to see yourself as God sees you. I think it's one of the things that stops us from understanding and fulfilling the vision that God has for us because we really don't understand how God looks at us and how God sees us. We, we, have, we listen to the lies. We believe the lies. We fall into the traps of, you know, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You make mistakes. I make mistakes. We hurt people. We unintentionally, intentionally, we, we're not perfect people. We won't be perfect you know, until the day that Christ comes. But because of what Christ has done for us, we can be perfect in the eyes of God. And God sees us at people that are not these failures, these, these, these flubbubs, these whatever Greek word, you, I don't know if flubbubs is a Greek word, but whatever word you want to throw in there to describe or how you feel about yourself, God sees you as someone, someone that when you understand the promise, when you understand how much he loves you, to be this empowered child of God that he could use in wonderful, beautiful ways to accomplish Victoria, vic- victorious things in your life. That's how he views you. Do you remember ever going to parent-teacher conferences, parents? <laughs> parents, do you remember when your parents went to parent-teacher conferences? Do you remember the things that were said about you at the parent-teacher conferences or you heard about it? It seems like the one thing that gets, gets talked about a lot, or maybe it was just for me that got talked about a lot, was, well, your child has a wonderful personality, <laughs> but talks a lot. You know, or man, your child's going to be a really good communicator because they're always talking to the people. Or hey, they're going to be so helpful when they get older because no matter what we're doing, they're always up out of their seat running around helping other people, you know. Or or did you hear this one? You know, he or she could be a great student if he or she would just apply themselves. I think my parents heard that at almost every single parent-teacher conference that was there. But I also wonder, I wonder if God ever looks at us like that. He looks at us and says, man, I know that he or she has the ability to accomplish great things for my kingdom. If he or she would just apply the promises that I have made, there would be no limits within their lives. Because it's great, or it's clear from the Great Commission that I just read from you, that God believes in us. He believes in you, but for some reason, we don't believe in ourselves. And and I'm not talking about self-confidence or self-esteem or building up some false sense of bravado or anything like that. I'm just talking about Understanding when you give your life to Christ, recognizing that God has and does instill within you the supernatural power to accomplish his vision for his kingdom. And so we all need to make some positive steps to correct this. And the first thing that we can do is just continually remind ourselves that we can do what God has asked us to do. Not because we are so intelligent, which you are. Not because we're so, you know, such wonderful people, which you are. But because God is everything he claims that he is. And if he says we can do it, guess what? We can do it. And so we realize who we are in the eyes of God. But we, always, we also need to realize that I'm just one part of the whole, all right? You and I, we're just one part of the whole. In Romans 12, it says this, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And when I first entered into ministry, I just felt like, you know, if I could just preach well enough, teach well enough, do the right things, work hard enough, you know, then, then, then everything would be good. The vision of God would be fulfilled in, in, in God's church. You could say I kind of thought everything really kind of depended on me. And thankfully, over the years, I have been recorrect, or I've been corrected, and, and I've learned that I am just one piece of a gigantic puzzle. Everything, praise God, does not rise and fall within my abilities. It rises or falls depending upon whether we are each doing our part for the greater good. Because think about it. There are literally millions of Christians throughout this world from many different nations. They have many different colors of skin. They speak many different languages. And God has put together this beautiful mosaic of people who when they understand their role and they work together, The church just flourishes, definitely. So what you and I have to do is is we just have to realize what piece of the puzzle has God called me to be and then place ourselves in that picture of God's overall will for his church. And when we do that, that basically what's happening is we're encouraging vision. We're encouraging vision in other people. Because as I said a minute ago, I discovered that not everything rises and falls upon me, praise God, you know. One of the most important duties that I can have as, as the senior minister here, as an elder within this church, working with the other elders in this church, is us to keep the vision, and we believe the purpose of what God has this church before us and before you. So you can catch that vision. 
So you can be excited about that vision. So you can understand, you know, what that vision is about. And not only do you catch it, but then you know why you, when somebody comes to you and says, hey, you go to that WCC place out there, don't you? Yeah, I do. Why? What's it all about? Now you understand the vision because you, you've been taught that vision and you can share that with others and that can be passed on and passed on. And so we have to understand what our participation is, you know? What does that mean with your participation, my participation? participation? See, it's, it's one thing to say we believe in God's vision, which, you know, we should, hopefully, you know, but it's quite another to participate in the vision that God has given us. Over the years in teaching and reading and going to seminars and even personal experience uh, over the years in, in my ministry, the people that seemed to get the most frustrated with the church were those that, that just, I believe, didn't understand the vision that God has for his church. You know, why is that church doing that? In other words, they hadn't caught the vision themselves. They didn't understand the vision themselves. And when someone has not caught the vision and understood the purpose for why we are the church, that usually means the reason they're struggling with it or they can't catch it or don't understand it is maybe because, maybe because they're just not involved with that as much. Because when you're not involved, it, it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like those people that sit up in the, in the stands on the sidelines during a sporting event. I mean, they might be excited about the game, but they have no idea kind of what's going on. You sit on the sidelines and you miss so much. Uh, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. As most of you know, I, I shared with you, when I was in school, I played football and, and everything. And when I was younger, I would go to the football games. And after the football game would get done, the high school football game would get done, we have an area where we could go and, you know, as the players were coming off the field, we could cheer them and clap good game and all this other kind of stuff, you know. And I'd get confused sometimes because, yeah, in the stands I would sit there and if it was a close game, I'd get excited, I'd cheer, you know, and those kinds of things. But I would watch these guys come off the field sometimes so emotional. I mean, sometimes they would have tears coming out of their eyes. And I'm like, you weenie? What, I mean, seriously, you're supposed to be this big masculine high school football player and you're crying? What is your issue? Come on, you know? And I can remember my friends making fun of them because I didn't understand. But then I got in the game. Then I got in the game and I started playing. And it was a whole different understanding. I played and I knew what a close game was like. I, I, I understand some of those. There was, uh, again, I shared with you, um, my junior year, we went to state championship and um, got to play. But of course, you had, before you could go play your state championship game, you had to have playoff games. The one playoff game before we got to the state championship, we went against this team called Des Moines Dowling, West Des Moines Dowling. They were uh, a private uh, Catholic school that could recruit anywhere in the world. And they did, and I'm not bitter about it. But, you know, they were, always <laughs> they, they were always recruiting the best, and they had the best. They were always in the playoffs, usually at state. But we stood in their way for their state game that time, and we had to play them to go to state. From the second that clock started ticking to the second it ended, I had never, ever played in that tough of a football game in my life. It was, I mean, everything about it, uh, spiritually, uh, emotionally, definitely physically, uh, when it came, came to that. I mean, it was so, such a high, intense game that our head coach, his wife, passed out in the stands, an ambulance came, had to take her, and we, our head coach had to go to the hospital. <laughs> the last half of the game, we didn't have our head coach uh, because he was at the hospital with his wife. Uh, that was, it was just that intense. We won the game, which meant we're going to go to state, Okay. And, 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 and get to play. If you would have come in the locker room, you would have thought we lost. I laid on the floor, and all I can remember thinking was taking me now, Lord Jesus. I was so tired. I was so spent. I didn't want to see another day. I didn't want to move. They kept saying, come on, we got a shower. The bus is waiting. You know, forget the bus. Just here, drag me out. Throw me under the bus, please. You know, there was nothing in me. You would have thought we lost the game. Um, from how we looked because we were so emotionally, like I said, in every aspect, just drained on, onto that aspect. We actually called that, if you talk to any of, my, any of the guys that played on the team, that was our state championship game. I mean, we went two weeks later, played state, we won it, and, and, and it, was a, you know, it was a hard game, uh, but th that was our state championship game. We call West Des Moines Dowling our state champ. When someone says, if you were to come up to one of my teammates and say, hey, who'd you play for state championship? We'll say Des Moines Dowling. 
Now, well, we played Bettendorf, but it was really Des Moines Dowling that, that did that. Now, I say all of that, and I bring all that into perspective, you know, uh, be, because of, of this. I mean, you might be sitting there going, I still don't understand. And that's understandable. Or some of you that have played, you know, you might understand. You might have understand that feeling of what it's like to be on that field, but you have no idea to understand how I felt there on that floor or how any of my teammates felt. And that's completely understandable because you weren't in that game. And again, I say all that because when I talk about the church and I talk about misunderstanding and I talk about not understanding the church where it is, that's why sometimes it gets so hard for people to understand. What do people get so excited about church for? I mean, what's the purpose of going on trips? I mean, you know, we went to Peru. So why, why, why go to Peru? Well, you know, the, the high school is just, we're in Nebraska a little while. This morning at 640, you know, the junior hires were meeting here. If you saw that nice little rock formation when you walked out of all those rocks, uh, yeah, that's what they were doing. And that came from the junior hires that they met here at 640 this morning to go up to Michigan. Why Michigan? I don't know. And, and stuff. Sorry, it's for my daughter-in-law that's back there with it, you know. Uh, they went to Michigan to go to CIY. Why? 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 You know? I had, when I was first started in youth ministry, I had a, a gentleman in the church. He didn't dislike me or anything, but he hated trips. What a waste of time, effort, and money when you could be doing that right here locally. And he always spoke against and tried to get the elders to cancel all the trips. So someone once told me, invite him to go on his missions trip. I thought, no, <laughs> you know? I mean, he's again, but I did. In that one week time, he got in the game. He understood. He went from the week before I went, being the person that was constantly against him, to what came back. He led all my fundraisers for all my trips because he got into the game. And when you get in the game, you have this understanding, you know. This renewal process we've been talking about involves getting off the sidelines and getting into the game. And if I don't participate in God's plan, if I don't participate in that vision, then, then that's why it can be difficult to, to hear God speak to us, to hear God's word. Again, if you allow me to stay with this illustration, you know, the coach, he doesn't share his place with those that aren't in the game. You'll never see, and if you do see, you might not be the coach after that game, take a bullhorn and turn around to the stands and say, okay, for the next play, we're going to be running such and such, and announce it to all those in the stands. The only people that know the play, the only people know what the coach is going to call, what the coach wants done, are those that are in the game. And so sometimes if you're having a hard time struggling, hearing God's word, knowing God's direction, understanding what God, maybe because it's God trying to say, get your attention like we talked about for 11 weeks before this. He's trying to say, hey, trying to get your attention. You need to get back into the game. You're kind of on the sidelines right now. I want to pull you into the game here. Because when we do this, there's going to be some great blessings. When we do this, the church will be blessed. See, we're getting ready to come before these elements here. The worship team's going to come out here and continue to lead us in worship, and you're going to be asked to come up and grab two of the cups and come back to your seat and just take some time and meditate and give thanks and praise for what God has done for us through His Son, Christ, and what these emblems represent. But when we, when we understand what God has called us, when we grasp that vision and start living it and getting to that game, wonderful things happen to the church, which is the people. The church grows spiritually. I mean, part of that commission that we read earlier was we were to make disciples. And so people start to understand, and people want to, to, to start to study. People are eager, eager to serve, and, and, and they start to grow spiritually and get involved and want to be involved, and, which means your church grows numerically because people out there, they want to be involved in a church that understands and that is doing its best to live out the truth. We struggle with truth today. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of comments about what the truth is and, and who is the truth and, you know, all this stuff that's fake and everything, you know. But, 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 but when we hold the truth, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when we live it the way that Christ asks us to live it and we model the way that Jesus modeled, people want to be a part of that. People want to catch that vision, live that vision, share that vision. And then, of course, financially and, and, and also other many ways, it'll grow because People want to give. They want to be a part of that. I mean, those are just, you know, small, quick ways that the church can be blessed. Because, my friends, God has called. God has called us to fulfill the dream that he has placed in our hearts to win people to Christ and to disciple them to maturity. And so as we come forward, and like I said, you partake of these elements and you give thanks, one of the things I'd just like you to also think about, and maybe let God's Spirit speak to your heart is, if that's not a dream that you're dreaming on a regular basis, then maybe the reason God brought you here today or maybe had you tune in today or for whatever, you know, on this is because he wanted to say, hey,
It's time for that recommitment. It's time for that surrender to the will. It's time for that, that spiritual renewal within your life. See if maybe that's what God is speaking to you today. And if you want to talk with somebody, don't leave here today without talking with one of our leaders. If you're watching online, give us a call because we're all about doing life together. But let's go before him right now and give him thanks and praise and let him speak to our hearts. Father, thank you so much for this time. Like I said, that we could come before you. We can be reminded of your plan and your purpose, your vision. Forgive us, Father God, when we forget, Lord, what we've been entrusted with. But Father, thank you for we can be reminded of that. Thank you for that love that is there. Uh, that you have for us of sending your son. And as we come before these elements, Lord, we praise you and thank you for what they represent. We praise you for the power that's there and, and all because your son and you loved us so much, Father. And, and, and Lord, also just speak to our hearts. Help us to understand, do we know, do we understand the vision that you have for your church, the purpose of why the church is here, why we do what we do? If not, Father God, may you fill us with the wisdom we need today. Lord, so we can start taking steps today to understand that, to commit to that, whatever it may need to be, Father, so we can fulfill that vision and share that vision as we go out, Lord. Thanks so much for this time and this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yeah, that just broke our this morning, God, that we would be reminded that you are our living hope. That we're, when, God, we're in the game and we're struggling, God, and, and we feel like we've given it our all. God, I pray that you would remind us that because you are a living hope, you can push us that extra step, that extra inch, God. And remind us that you're all we need, God. God, we thank you. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a good week.